This story takes place in 2016. Security cameras had caught most of the brawl on video. The drunken punches thrown on a South Bronx corner known for fistfights and stabbings, a young man in a dark hooded sweatshirt dancing away as four men march after him, a pit bull running down the block alongside them. One of the pursuers was Roberto Rodriguez, a Mexican immigrant known as Gordo, for his considerable girth. Another was his roommate Martinez. At 11.10 pm, the figures disappear into the gauzy haze of a floodlight. No security cameras recorded what happened next, but a cell phone captured the aftermath. Mr. Martinez lies on the sidewalk, groaning. Dark blood runs from a wound on his right side. Two friends urge him to hold on a guante, amigo. One fashions a bandage from a t-shirt stripped off his back. An arriving police officer bends to see Mr. Martinez's wound, another radios for an ambulance to be dispatched to the scene, on East 151st Street in the Melrose neighborhood. Put a rush on the bus, he says. 151. Mr. Rodriguez, 30, walks calmly into the beam of an arriving officer's flashlight, one camera shows. His thick silhouette pivots, and he raises his arm toward a green building at 367 East 151st Street, into which the young man in the sweatshirt had fled. His hand is pressed hard to his right side, where he, too, has been stabbed. Still, he walks with purpose, treating his injury as an annoyance. Surveillance footage captured the lead up to the death of Roberto Rodriguez, a Mexican immigrant who was fatally stabbed in May in the South Bronx. On the night of May 7, just as they stepped outside the view of working security cameras, Roberto Rodriguez and Lazaro Martinez were stabbed. Officers arrived one minute later to find Martinez bleeding out on the sidewalk. Rodriguez, who went by the nickname Gordo, was stumbling around saying he'd been robbed. Martinez survived, making him a major witness to the murder of his friend Gordo, who died just after midnight. Police later arrested a teenager nicknamed Diablito, who has links to the Cholo's 152 gang. People who must have seen the stabbing, or might know something more about what happened. For example, in this moment, Gordo attacks an unidentified woman and three other people in a crosswalk, igniting the brawl. It seems random. Then, reputed members of the Cholo gang run up the street and join the fray. One of them is 18-year-old Alberto Aquino Simon. Gordo and his friend chase Diablito and another man. They fight, then move beyond the reach of the cameras, into a halo of light. A minute later Martinez collapses and Gordo reappears, clutching his side. The police did not know it, but his liver had been pierced and he was bleeding internally. They did not put him in an ambulance until 10 minutes after Martinez. He died a half hour later in the hospital. The murder weapon was never found. Nine years earlier, hoping to earn money to help build a better life for his infant son in Mexico, Mr. Rodriguez had crossed the Sonoran Desert with a smuggler and entered the United States. In New York City, he found work in kitchens and on construction sites. That was long ago, before his wife in Hidalgo State ran off with his brother-in-law, before he started drinking heavily and using drugs, before he started associating with the Serenos 13 gang, and moved into a squalid walk up a block away, living with his pitbull and several workers like him. Now, late on a muggy Saturday night in May, his hand still cupping his wound, Mr. Rodriguez led the police to the door that he said the young man had entered. Where is he? An officer asked. Right here, Mr. Rodriguez said, motioning at the building. His calm belied a fatal fact. The knife had pierced his liver, deep inside, he was bleeding. He hung his head and leaned on a wrought iron handrail as another friend tried, in halting English, to describe the attacker. Five minutes later, an ambulance came for Mr. Martinez. As it pulled away, Mr. Rodriguez stepped over to a car and rested his weight on the trunk. Then he fell to his knees, and to the ground. A second ambulance was called. An officer performed chest compressions. The paramedics raced with Mr. Rodriguez to Lincoln Medical and Mental Health Center, where Mr. Martinez had already been rushed into surgery. Mr. Martinez lived. Mr. Rodriguez, 2,500 miles from his hometown, died at 12.05 a.m. What looked at first like a brawl between strangers was in fact a fight between men who knew each other well. Fingerprints soon led detectives to a suspect, Alberto Aquino Simon, 19, who was often seen socializing with Mr. Rodriguez. A grand jury later would later indict him on charges of murder and attempted murder. When Mr. Aquino Simon turned himself in 11 days after the stabbings, his lawyer said he had acted in self-defense. Then, a few days later, detectives learned that what seemed like a spontaneous episode of drunken violence might well have been an act of revenge or intimidation. 
It turned out that Mr. Rodriguez had told people he had witnessed Mr. Aquino Simon stab a rival gang member at a Bronx Street Fair in June 2015. Mr. Rodriguez let it be known he was willing to testify in court, and he seemed undeterred by the prospect of antagonizing the Cholos 152, a Mexican-American gang whose members he had come to know, and who consider 151st Street and Kirtland Avenue to be their territory. That corner was a long way from the cramped cement house where Mr. Rodriguez grew up in Tulancingo, Hidalgo. He was the youngest son of a construction worker and part-time musician, living with five siblings under an improvised tin roof, held down by ropes and cable cords. His family called him Beto. His mother, Barbara Robles, said Mr. Rodriguez was a mischievous boy who liked to hike and fish, but was bored at school and dropped out after the sixth grade. When he was little, he earned money by picking up bags of groceries for people at the bus station, and at age 11, he would tag along with his father to construction sites. He took jobs in textile factories and married young. When his bride, Maribel Peralta, became pregnant, he decided to move to the United States in search of higher pay, telling his family he hoped to save enough to one day open a gymnasium in Tulancingo and buy a piece of land. That was his only dream, to leave something to his son. Just before his son was born, Mr. Rodriguez made his first attempt to cross the border. Agents with the United States Border Patrol caught him after his trek through the Sonoran Desert, detained him for 10 days and sent him back. He still had spines and burrs in his feet when he stumbled into his family's living room, his mother said. That summer, Ms. Peralta gave birth. Her father, living in New York City, paid a smuggler $3,500 to take Mr. Rodriguez across the border again. This time, Mr. Rodriguez made it. He found work in restaurants and on construction sites. His relatives said he called home twice each week to ask about his son, Alan, and to request pictures. Then, a year into his stay, things fell apart. Ms. Peralta had an affair and left him, leaving their son with his parents. The breakup left Mr. Rodriguez with no emotional anchor in Mexico, and as the years wore on, his family noticed changes. He started calling home drunk, got tattoos and developed a taste for marijuana, his sister said. His descent into depression and alcohol abuse mirrors a pattern that researchers have identified among some male illegal immigrants who are severed from their families and unable to go home. Three years prior, Mr. Rodriguez's call stopped altogether. Signs that Mr. Rodriguez was drifting appeared on his Facebook page. Sereno's gang symbols on his apartment walls, photos of him posing with a pistol and with a bowie knife. He landed a job as a taco cook at El Bravo on Melrose Avenue, where he told his employers that other gang members drove him from Queens with death threats, an owner said. It was there, during idle moments around El Bravo's pool table, that he befriended members of the Cholos 152. Rodriguez did not last long as a cook. He was fired after six months for selling drugs out of the kitchen, taking loans he did not repay, and getting into fistfights with patrons. For the last few months, he had been doing demolition work in Yonkers. The apartment where he lived with several roommates at East 151st Street became known for rowdy parties. Mr. Rodriguez did not pay rent, his landlord said, but charged friends $200 a month to sleep on his floor. Members of the Cholos drank and smoked marijuana in the building's dingy stairwell, as well as in Mr. Rodriguez's apartment, neighbors said. While drinking, Mr. Rodriguez would express bitterness over his low pay, his status as an illegal immigrant and his station in life. He was quick to start fights or use his pitbull, Duchess, to intimidate people. He was a violent person when he drank, said a neighbor who considered Mr. Rodriguez a friend. He used to bully people. Still, neighbors said he could be jovial and big-hearted when he was sober. He held barbecues in a small concrete yard in front of his building, grilling chicken he had bought wholesale from a friend, and providing coolers of cold beer. He also longed for female companionship, friends said. Two years ago, he started an online relationship with a divorced woman in Mexico and began sending her money to help support her two children, the woman. On his days off, he would sit at the same table near the beer cooler in the Huaxcuaxla restaurant on Kirtland Avenue, looking at the altar for the Virgin of Guadalupe and listening to Norteno music on the Juca box. He always ordered a steak with green chiliquiles and a Modelo beer. At first, detectives thought Mr. Rodriguez's drinking may have been at the root of the stabbing. Fights arise frequently at 151st Street and Kirtland Avenue, the police and residents said, usually over petty grievances, drunken insults or romantic triangles. 
Sometimes, the combatants are immigrant men like Mr. Rodriguez, who are drawn to the area's low-priced rooms, and are sometimes seen staggering from corner to corner as night falls. But the street is also home to children of the Mexican migrants who began arriving in large numbers in the mid-1990s. In total, there were at least 600,000 Mexican immigrants and their children in New York City and the surrounding counties. The teenagers and young adults, whose parents are mostly from rural towns in Puebla, Guerrero and Oaxaca, are now graduating from high school and college. A few, like Mr. Aquino Simon, have dropped out of school to join street gangs like the Cholos and the Vedos Locos. The block presents a microcosm of the Mexican diaspora in the South Bronx, with immigrants at different stages of their American experience. The halls of nearby apartment buildings are filled in the afternoons, with the smell of spiced meats and the sounds of ranchera accordion music. Men come and go covered with the dust of work sites or dressed in the orange vests and ball caps, favored by the army of food deliverymen in Manhattan. Women tow children home after school and work. The afternoon of May 7 began with Mr. Rodriguez and his roommates partying early, around 4 p.m., according to Mr. Martinez. The seven men were off that day. They watched television, listened to music and roasted a pork loin, he said. Then the beer ran out. At 11 p.m., Mr. Martinez, another guy and Mr. Rodriguez, went to buy more beer and sandwiches at the corner bodega. There, he said, they encountered about six cholos in the street, among them Mr. Aquino Simon. They were already there, and they were looking for trouble. Mr. Aquino Simon yelled something in English to Mr. Rodriguez, and the fight ignited. But another immigrant living at the house told the police that it was he who had been dispatched to buy the beer and got into a fight at the bodega. He said several of his roommates, including Mr. Rodriguez, had come to his aid. Others said the fight might have been about money. Two witnesses said in interviews that they had heard Mr. Rodriguez telling his friends just before the brawl that he had been robbed and urging them to find the person who had taken his money. He also told the first police officers who responded that Mr. Aquino Simon had taken something from him. Security camera videos from a nonprofit on the corner do little to clarify things. They show Mr. Rodriguez march up to a group of three people and, without breaking stride, punch a woman, knocking her and one of her companions to the ground. Those people were never found by detectives. Then Mr. Aquino Simon and at least three other reputed cholos can be seen sprinting up the block from 367 East 151st Street, where neighbors said they used a second-floor apartment as a trap house to smoke marijuana and host parties. Mr. Aquino Simon joins the fray. 35 seconds later, Mr. Aquino Simon is seen on security camera video backing down the sidewalk toward the building that holds the gang's hangout, with Martinez and other dude following him. He hits Martinez twice before retreating again, with an unidentified man at his side. Mr. Rodriguez and another guy arrive, and the four friends move in a group toward Mr. Aquino Simon. One witness said Mr. Aquino Simon ran into the building, vowing to his companion that he would kill someone, then returning to the sidewalk a minute later with a knife. A second witness saw Mr. Rodriguez and Martinez struggling to open the door of the building. Neither witness saw the stabbing itself. Martinez said he remembered standing on the sidewalk, fighting with Mr. Aquino Simon and a second man, who had a cane, when Mr. Aquino Simon's knife entered his side with a sickening thump. Then he blacked out, he said. Another witness told detectives that he saw Mr. Aquino Simon open the door of the building and thrust with a knife toward both Mr. Martinez and Mr. Rodriguez, as they stood on the landing. Blood was found inside the vestibule and just outside the door. Everyone remembers it differently, that's just the way it goes. Then came a twist. A detective received a tip that Mr. Rodriguez had been feuding with the Cholos over his plans to testify in court that Mr. Aquino Simon was responsible for the stabbing of a rival gang member in June 2015 at the Bronx Terminal Market. Mr. Rodriguez had made his decision to testify known in the neighborhood, giving Mr. Aquino Simon a motive to silence him. In an interview at the Rikers Island Jail Complex, Mr. Castellan asserted his innocence, just as he said his friend Mr. Rodriguez would have. Honestly, I didn't do it, he said. Mr. Castellan denied being a gang leader, saying the Cholos were more like friends than a gang. But the police said he took over as the leader of the Cholos in late 2013, after Miguel Castellan a distant relative was paralyzed in a shooting related to a long-running feud between the Cholos and the Vedos Locos. The twist had a complicated backstory. 
Anthony Velazquez, now 25, a reputed Vados Locos member, was attacked by at least eight men at the fair in the Bronx Terminal Market, according to a criminal complaint. Mr. Velazquez has a child with Castellan's sister. He told the police that Mr. Castellan had stabbed him after an argument over custody of the baby. Mr. Castellan said that he did not join in the attack and that Mr. Rodriguez would have exonerated him. Mr. Rodriguez had seen the fight because he had borrowed Mr. Castellan's car that day and brought several cholos to the fair, including Mr. Aquino Simon, he said. We were all friends, Mr. Castellan said. We know each other very well. Mr. Rodriguez showed up at the courthouse along with other defense witnesses the day the grand jury met, several of Mr. Castellan's relatives said. He was discouraged from testifying after being informed he might open himself up to prosecution, but he intended to appear at Mr. Castellan's trial this fall, Mr. Del Valle said. The Bronx District Attorney's Office said it had no record that Mr. Rodriguez offered his testimony to the grand jury. Prosecutors had the testimony of the victim and a second witness, both of whom knew Mr. Castellan well enough to identify him as the assailant. Mr. Castellan said he had once been close to Mr. Aquino Simon, a son of Mexican immigrants who was raised by a single mother in the Wagner houses in East Harlem. Mr. Aquino Simon had shown up in Cholo's territory around 2013 and befriended several members of the gang, hanging around at El Bravo, where Mr. Rodriguez worked, Mr. Castellan said. Though Mr. Aquino Simon had good grades and ran track, he dropped out of high school his sophomore year when his girlfriend became pregnant. Intent on supporting his child, he delivered food for an Italian restaurant on East 86th Street. Later, he got a job working for a wholesale grocer in Hunts Point. A club manager and a lifelong resident of 151st Street said Mr. Aquino Simon had confided to him that he joined the Cholos for fear of other gangs. He did it because he needed protection. He adopted the name Diablito, meaning Little Devil. He started tagging lampists and buildings along 151st Street with the letters CLS, for Cholos, people who knew him said. He was arrested three times over two years on felony charges, including robbery and assault, but the records of those proceedings were sealed because of his age, the police said. Since Mr. Rodriguez's death, the men who live in his apartment have avoided the street, shuttering themselves inside and declining interviews. Several said they were afraid of reprisals from the Cholos for speaking to the police. The men who took part in the fight had moved away and the remainder were facing eviction, the landlord said. Detective Simplicio acknowledged that it would be hard to track them down when the case comes to trial. In Mexico, Mr. Rodriguez's family buried him in a churchyard near his house after raising money to transport his remains. His body was too wide for the standard coffin provided by the Mexican government. His last phone call home was in 2013, when he spoke to the son he hardly knew. His son asked him, Daddy, when are you coming back? He responded. Any day now. Any day.